Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 720. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 22nd, 2022. Okay, people, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where Kevin and George sit down and we talk about all things Anglican, some things Christian, and occasionally, okay, maybe every episode, we dabble a bit into politics. It, it, it's fun, fun to talk about. And that's what we call Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. Before we get too far into the program, please like this episode. It's free for you to like, um, and it really helps us with free advertising. We appreciate that. If you have not subscribed to the show yet, click that little red rectangle and then the bell and you'll get instant notifications anytime we post a new episode. Go to the comment section. Oh my goodness, we get you know, almost 100 comments per episode. Uh, people offering their opinion, offering corrections to our stories, and keeping the conversation going. We really, really appreciate that. And if you've not shared Anglican Unscripted recently with family, friend, or foe, you just copy that URL and you send it to, to share everybody or post it on your own Facebook page. We appreciate that very much. George, how you been doing? Stressful. Uh, go to closing on our new home, uh, our present home, on Tuesday. And so far the bank is, says they have all the things they need from us, but I'm just waiting for them to ask for something at Friday at 4.30, uh, just when I can't get my hands on it. Yeah, I still have PTSD from my mortgage uh, application years ago. No, I, I understand what you're going through. So, you, but when it's all over and you you finally sign that final document, forty pages in, the relief you're going to feel is amazing because you, you, now you're a homeowner. You're part of. You're living that American dream, and you, you got a place to stay now for you know half a generation. You love it, George. Well, I can't wait to be able to walk out to the lawn and say, you kids get off my lawn, and it really is my lawn. <laughs> I'm not going to call the landlord. I'm the landlord. That's yeah. great. All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about some news. Well, before we do, this is a really nice day in Florida. You know, uh, we stay here in the winters, and the winters it can be 60 degrees or 50 degrees, and the lows get down to 32 degrees. Today is an 85er, which... I think it's a little early in the season to have 85ers. Am I wrong? No, this is the uh, fall spring. Uh, this time of year, we get a few weeks of uh, wonderful weather where it's dry, warm. Uh, my daughter, Laura, is visiting from California for two weeks, and she and Susan, my wife, went to the beach. And the air, air temperature is in the mid-80s, but the water temperature is only in the mid-60s. So Laura from California thinks that's wonderful. Susan thinks that's freezing. But after this season, we get the pollen season, and then we get real spring, and at real spring, which is just in time for the kids to come down to Daytona Beach, the water is up to the 80s and the air is up to the 80s. So uh, we're, we're waiting for those to intersect. All right. Yeah, it won't be too long. We've got, we've got most of our trip planned for the summer, and I'll let you guys know more about that as we, we get closer. Uh, let's go here to show notes. And... Uh, we left a cliffhanger last week. We were going to talk about church for the sake of others, and there just wasn't time because it's always a bigger topic, and we want to handle it correctly and not lead any uh, uh, question as to what we're reporting. So uh, we were sent a video of a church who is a, is a Presbyterian church, and they're interested in joining the ACNA. But they're leaving the Presbyterian church because... They don't fully agree with the Presbyterian uh, um, uh, understanding of same-sex relationships and same-sex uh, feelings and emotions and all that. And even though the Presbyterian Church does completely agree with ASCNA, they think, hey, well, let's go to, to C4SO, uh, a byproduct of the ACNA, because they agree with us, even though they don't agree with the ACNA. And I thought we could hammer this out because is C4SO always going to be that liberal uh, outage here of the ACNA where churches who just don't agree with the current denomination on uh, same-sex issue want to go, George? Well, we'll sh we shall see how the bishops of the ACNA handle this, but 
The story is there's a church called Grace Church Seattle. It's a Presbyterian Church of America congregation. And if you look at their YouTube and worship videos, it's the sort of place where they've got a pastor who uh, has an open neck shirt and a sports coat and skinny jeans and black sneakers, who stands on a uh, stage, uh, no altar, anything like that, drum set on one side, smoke machine on the other. They're on the Canterbury Trail. They've become enamored with the uh, historic Episcopate and the basically Anglican way of doing things in the prayer book. But they also uh, hold on to, if you will, the culture of modern America or modern Seattle. They're on the progressive side on uh, the gender and sexuality issues. And their priest, uh, their minister, has uh, been exploring, and he's mentioned this in his sermons, bringing them into the Diocese of C4SO because he feels an affinity with the bishop and the work that that diocese is doing with young people and in its approach to worship and life. Now, I have to say, if any of our Anglo Catholic or REC friends stopped in for a worship, there they would basically run out screaming uh I, being I, silly I, of course yeah i know I, I think they're they're much more tolerant than that but you know but here here's this reality we have on the ground um c4so does a wonderful job reaching the youth it does a wonderful job in in growing and planting churches what we find and discover is they have kind of a, an open-mindedness to this woke culture. They also have an open-mindedness to where uh, sexuality is defined within the Bible and within the ACNA and within culture. And they don't really want to over-define things because they think that would exclude people they're trying to reach. And whereas you mean well, the one thing you want to be very certain of in this day and age is your definitions of words and what they mean. Because we know Satan is the author of confusion. And if we're mm -hmm. trying to bring uh, the gospel and bring Jesus and bring transformation into the lives of this lost generation, you have to be sure they understand what you're saying and you have to find your words so that they understand completely what it means to live a transformed life. And I, I, I can't have this wishy-washiness. It bothers me greatly, George. Well, one of the successes or geniuses of Anglicanism is its tradition of uh, conversation and compromise. However, people misunderstand what we mean by compromise. It doesn't mean being wishy-washy. It means having Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals who may not, uh, who do not share uh, a common idea as to what is actually happening at the Eucharist, being able to kneel together shoulder to shoulder and worship the living God, Jesus Christ. We're in conversation, we compromise, we don't insist that they do it our way or we, they, we have to do it their way. But that stands on top of the unchanging eternals of this gospel and uh, the doctrines of the church. So for some people on the Canterbury Trail, they're enamored with the externals and the buzzwords but they really don't see what truly is there and what which has allowed the Anglican Church to prosper and survive all these centuries. Compromise does not be being wishy-washy. No, but I, I would fully invite uh, Grace Church into the ACNA uh, from Seattle and to experience not just the Diocese of the C4SO, uh, so, but all the ACNA has to offer and all the Anglican Communion has to offer. Uh, I have... <clears throat> Clearly, I still have great hope for the Anglican Communion, or I'll have to change the, the name of the channel here to something besides Anglican TV. George, let's uh, move on to well, some more. Actually, what, yeah. I, what, I, what I am hoping is if they introduce a Nirvana Mass, just like we have the YouTube Mass. <laughs> YouTube Eucharist. Uh, YouTube Eucharist, have a Nirvana Eucharist. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, grunge. The grunge Eucharist is what we call it. Let's uh, talk about a story we found on davido.net. The Diocese of Perth is, once again, going down the um, 
the actions that would cause division. And it's, it's caused clearly by the Archbishop wanting to uh, live within the culture she so desires. And let's, let's tell the people the story, George. Well, there are four ordinations scheduled in the coming week at, by Kay Goldsworthy at the Cathedral in Perth, Western Australia. Goldsworthy, a uh, little background, 3, 8, 2018, 2019, released a statement on human sexuality saying it basically chased in marriage, celibate, and singleness. Uh, so basically she affirmed the Lambeth 110 and the traditional Anglican understanding. Well, two of the candidates uh, for ordination, one of them was a prominent layman who lived with his partner, a woman, and they've had several children. He went all throughout the process for ordination with uh, being unmarried, but living with a woman and having children. Sort of the common, you know, I don't want to even say boomer, but Gen Z, you know, we don't need marriage business. We've seen that since well, the 1960s, yes. Well, he, he finally wised up in a few weeks. Uh, he recently got married. Uh, but after basically being through the system several years, I think finally somebody said, well, you might as well do this just before you get ordained. And the other is a partnered gay man uh, with a, a same-sex partner is going to be ordained. And the Church Anglican Church of Australia is more conservative than the Church of England, certainly more conservative than the Episcopal Church in its doctrine and formularies. You can't do this. And there are people who are gay clergy who have come out after ordination, if you will, um, including the presenter at the cathedral in Perth, recently appointed by uh, the uh, diocese, a, a gay partnered man. So for the, if you will, the conservatives in the Anglican Church of Australia, and certainly for the conservative minority in the diocese of Perth, this is a spit in the eye. Because the bishop has said one thing, and now the diocesan machine led by the bishop is doing the exact opposite. You can have, you can be a partnered man with children with your partner, not your wife. You can be a partnered same-sex person. And what the church, what the bishop has said is wrong. What the church's doctrines do not permit, it's okay. So this is a this is a, a flashpoint. Yeah, no, I agree, and. Uh... You know, we've certainly talking, talking. We've certainly spoken with uh, David old enough to know that uh, of any church I've seen uh, with Anglican Communion, the Diocese of Sydney and what's happening down under, there seems to be ebbs and flows. You know, they, they, they don't seem to be, have the, the loss we see like with the Episcopal Church, where it, it's one and done. They, they, they're fighting the good fight, and they have a much more strategic way of fighting uh, what's happening down there than we ever did up here in the Episcopal Church, which it's good to see because, you know, if you watch what happened here in North America and Canada, what's happening over in the Church of England, you got to say, is there any hope? So, you know, cool. Uh, next conversation we're going to have is talking about uh, the Church of England and their desire to hold up one of the greatest evils we can think of, uh, conversion therapy, um, and praying for people who want to uh, leave the uh, same sex and homosexual lifestyle. George, what's the story? Gavin Collins is the area bishop of Dorchester, which is within the Diocese of Oxford. We'd call him a suffragan bishop in the U.S. England, he's an area bishop. On the diocesan webpage, he penned a condemnation of the clergy petition, national petition, asking the government to make sure that if they ban conversion therapy, they make an allowance for praying for people who wish deliverance from same-sex attractions. English government is looking to ban conversion therapy. In other words, that you can go to a psychologist and ask to be treated for same-sex attractions. They want to forbid that. The United States that has been tried in some places and it's in the courts right now, but basically in the United States where it's standing right now is that it's a free speech. You cannot forbid somebody uh, to pra not practice a certain psychology or religion or whatnot. England, you can. And in Canada, you can. In Europe, you can. The freedom of speech is not what we know it to be in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, 
led by uh, Ian Paul, a friend of the show, and some other clergy, uh, a very thoughtful letter was written to the government, signed by 1,500, 2,000 clergy across England of all denominations, saying, look, if you're going to criminalize us praying for people, then we're ready to be criminals because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in Jesus Christ, and we have seen it. Look, here are examples. We know people where this has worked. Kevin, you know people. I know people. <laughs> in fact, I, so, I entirely have too many friends who are post uh, same sex attracted. I no, I agree. You know, we call it the ex ex gay movement, the post gay movement. Um, those people are ignored by the government, ignored by the Episcopal Church, for example. And whenever we have discussions of these things. Well, the Bishop of Dorchester has basically come down on the side of the hard left gay activists saying, you should go to jail if you pray for somebody. And what the bishop did is he set up a straw man. He condemned, uh, essentially, he's saying those people who want to pray, he's basically saying what you want to do is really lock people up in institutions, subject them to electroshock therapy or something like that to sort of uh, zap the gay out of them. And that's evil, and, and that's unchurch of England, and we've rejected that, and therefore your whole petition is wrong. That's not what the petition's about. That's called the straw man argument. You know, absolutely. What, the, what we're talking now about is the different is the Church of England ministers and other ministers involved, Free Church and others, are saying that not only should we have a civil right to pray for people, we have a duty and an obligation as believing Christians to pray for people. And the idea that your self-autonomy is now subject to government uh, control. Um, what's next? Uh, the government's saying that if you're, a, if you're a, a swimmer at a university and a male swimmer and now you want to be a woman swimmer, you can't do that because... Uh, your thoughts are bad thoughts. I'm being silly now. No, no. Course, no. But yeah, you know, the, the cultural norms have changed drastically. Well, in the last couple hundred years, but these were the same cultural norms back in the in the first century. You know, and the New Testament addresses that. It says, you know, I, I can just read, Kevin, why, and George, why do you always have to talk about homosexuality? Well, I, I think we, could, we can package this real quick. Uh, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? And this is uh, certainly from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And we talk about this because nobody disagrees that swindlers and slanderers and drunkards and greedy and all the other people on the list are going to uh, have trouble getting into the kingdom. There's just a question about whether or not a person who uh, practices homosexual sex would. And I said, well, if we're going to let the homosexual sex slide, then we need to let the greedy people slide. And if we let the greedy people slide, we need to let the, the wicked and the adulterers slide. You know, why do we have to always pick on the greedy people? And you well, no, why are you always picking on the homosexuals? We're not. We're pointing out the text of the of the New Testament here and why it is transformative and life changing for all those people on the list. And the the rules of the games are just changing so rapidly I can't keep up. Um mm -hmm. I used to be an avid reader of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal when I was younger. Uh I haven't I had a subscription to the New York Times for 10, 15 years, the print edition. And But I still get mailers from them asking me to come back and all this and that. And they've had a recent series of ads of New York Times readers, different types of profiles. And the last one I got, you know, it has this uh, rather odd-looking woman. She then said, I'm a, I'm a uh, woman of color. You can't really tell what color she is. Uh, by questioning art designer and my likes are this and that and what I wish for the world I wish for a world where we had Harry Potter but not its author and what the New York Times now is doing it's trying to de JK Rowling mm -hmm. 
the Harry Potter books because J.K. Rowling is now on the bad thought list because she stands. J.K. Rowling is a very liberal person, but she stands firm on women are women and men are men, and women, men thinking that they're women sh should not be considered women. They should be considered people needing psychiatric help. Well, she and before may be that, the, the New York well, yeah, she may be the greatest fiction, woman fictional author in generations. And Since Agatha knows, Christie. Yeah, she knows fiction when she sees it. And she knows this new cultural norm of transgenderism is fiction. It's fantasy. She knows fantasy. She's a billionaire because she created a fantastical world. So she knows what fantasy looks like. And we're in a world now where the New York Times thinks it's a good idea to savage J.K. Rowling in order to attract subscribers. Well, I can tell you that all, that that ad didn't, it really wasn't targeted for me. I didn't all of a sudden say, now I've got to subscribe. Oh, but what the world is coming to. Yeah. yeah. Back to the first century it is. Uh, let's go over here back to the show notes. And next on the list, I should just keep this up on my phone original tab um oh you posted a story about a person who is going to be deported from turkey back to iran and people say well what's he doing in turkey because turkey itself is a place where christians are persecuted uh most of the middle east is a place where christians are persecuted let's talk a little about the story because iran is a worse place than turkey and this would be very significant if he had to go back to the place where he used to be a Christian evangelical. Hekmat Salimi is a man, I think in his late 60s, early 70s. He is a priest of the Anglican Diocese of Iran. As a young man, he converted from Islam to Christianity. And under the influence of the bishop at that time, became an Anglican priest before the revolution. He's been able to stick it out while the bishop had to go into exile and so many other people, Anglican Christians, had to leave. He's been able to continue his ministry quietly, not attracting attention. He's kept his head down and preaching the gospel. He had to flee Iran six years ago with his wife and adult daughter because the next wave of persecution was coming and it was quite clear that he was on the list to disappear or to go into prison, not only because he's a Christian priest, but because he's a convert from Islam. Well, he fled the country and went to Turkey, crossed the border, and was given asylum in Turkey. And he's been in Turkey for the last six years. Now, the way international asylum works is that when you leave country A and go to country B, you cannot then say, okay, I'm going to go to country Q because that has a better welfare system. So if you're a, if you're a uh, refugee from civil violence in Honduras and you make it over the border to Guatemala and then make it over the border to Mexico, you should seek uh, refugee status in Guatemala or Mexico instead of keep going north to go to the United States or in Europe, you know. Now, Turkey's government has decided to be difficult and in recent years, we've reported about the prosecution of Christian missionaries there. The persecution of Christians in Turkey is ramping up. And now they're going to deport this guy, this priest who's been there, because they're saying to him, well, Iran's constitution says there's freedom of religion. Therefore, we're going to send you back, back to Iran. And this guy is trying to find a way not to be deported back to Iran, because what's going to happen? We know what's going to happen. Well, we know what's going to happen. And when we say freedom of religion, yes, in theory, on paper, Iran and a couple other Arab countries have uh, written into their constitution or bylaws safety for those who practice a different religion, except for those who are in the country trying to convert people to their religion. Uh, evangelical Christians are hated in Iran. Zionist Jews are hated in Iran. Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, mean to mince words here, but you, you can be the most silent believer of your beliefs in Iran, but don't speak out and don't try and convert. 
And here's the thing, our church leaders, we're, they're talking about global warming, they're talking about mosquito nets, they're talking about things that are before the, they're talking about gun control uh, in Michigan. Now, here's a joke. They talk about gun control in the suburbs of Michigan, not about gun control in the city of Detroit where black kids are killing black kids. We don't hear a word about that. Mm -hmm. But white kids killing white kids, that's a crisis. Where are our church leaders? Here's the time when the Anglican community can stand up and do something for an individual, whether it's bring him to Europe or to Italy or to the United States or to Canada, someplace where he can get asylum as a bona fide refugee from political persecution. But as we've seen in England, hardly any Christian refugees from Syria, for example, are given asylum. Almost all the refugees are Muslims. The government there has a discrimination policy against Christians. The Biden administration's the same way. Um, Christian persecution is not an issue on the governments of Europe and America's list. Recently, the uh, U.S. removed Nigeria from the list of countries of political concern for persecution of Christians. And the Nigerian, uh, the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, basically pull up saying, what are you talking about? It's never been worse. The persecution and the murder of Christian farmers by Fulani Muslim tribesmen is increasing day by day. And Boko Haram is even worse than all this. And what, where are our religious leaders? Well, uh, where are they? They're trying to keep the doors open. Diocese of Connecticut, a perfect example. Uh, they, they run Christians out of the churches. They've helped form the ACNA. And now they find out their churches are empty. The, and the elderly who were supported and keeping the churches uh, um, above and, and in the black are, are dying off and gone. What, what will we do to fill our churches? We can't call the Christians back. Why don't we call the spiritual back, George? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Well, we may as well have mushrooms to smoke and uh, pot to sell because you, you're going back to the 60s and 70s again. Invite the spiritual back. Yeah, there's a church I in Fairfield County, uh, right off the New York, New Haven and Hartford line up from New York. One of these old Episcopal churches on the green in one of these towns mm -hmm. that has all of a sudden decided, why don't we do an outreach? Because our church is empty and we have prime real estate, why don't we be, offer worship opportunities to the spiritual but not religious? And there was a recent religion news service article about this where self-congratulatory uh, preening on both sides uh, about how morally righteous these people were and what a new innovation this was. But man, I have seen this stuff ever since I was a child. You know, back in the 60s, the Episcopal Church wanted to be the church of what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ditching the priest's collar for a white turtleneck and uh, sandals and uh, offering an empty spirituality may seem offering a spirituality that has no basis other than worshiping the inner self is no basis but, but no it's, it's spiritual saving, hedonism. Right? It, it is spiritual hedonism be the best you you can be it, it, that's that's the eucharist of spiritual hedonism. i thought that i thought that that was the u.s army commercial be no. all that you can be or... that's different be the best oh, you okay. you can be is the the new spiritual the the new spiritual hedonism where we every person is an individual every person is their own god every person is completely in control of every thought desire and future they have and we so empower you because we're empowered to be the best you that you can be and boy if there's any anti-gospel message ever that's the one yeah you know? the gospel of transformation it's up it well there's several things here it first it's uh, it's the old heresies come back again and again and again the old songs are replayed and a new generation thinks they're new and neat and original and they're not mm -hmm. but it's actually it's the same 
at its base the same problem that we have underway now in South Africa. And last week, uh, this week, I printed the communique from the House of Bishops of South Africa, Southern Africa, on their bishops meeting. And, you know, I printed it. And after I printed it, I read it through in detail. And a line struck me. And let me just, if I may, Kevin, I want to read you that line. Or had a schedule. Communique from the bishops of Southern Africa from February 2022. Go all the way down to pastoral matters. And so I'm looking through this thinking, ooh, pastoral matters might be of interest. And, oh, they want to look at lay presidency of the Eucharist. Eh, yeah, Oh, exciting, you know, let's set the Catholics and the evangelicals on fire. Go down, go down, go down <coughs> their list. And then it, there's a heading called Isangoma. Don't know what that is off the top of my head. I'll read it to you. Synod deliberated on the issue of clergy who are embracing traditional practices such as training to be a diviner, a sangoma, and claiming that this is a call from the ancestors. The issue will be investigated before further being discussed by Synod. Let's pause for a second. What did I just read? There are clergy in the South African church who are training to be and believe that they are traditional tribal shamans, witch doctors, witch doctors healers. Yes. Now, witch doctors may seem pejorative to some people, but it's the word that we all know. Um, and so I contacted some uh, friends, uh, people who've written for us in the past in South Africa, saying, what's going on here? Um, I remember about 10, 12 years, 10, 15 years ago, the South African bishops released a statement basically condemning uh, syncretism, which is the melding of Christianity with local faiths, the church, the church around it. And at that time, there was a priest in, I think, in the Eastern Cape, or the Western Cape, uh, who sacrificed an ox at a church service as a propitiation to the spirits of the ancestors. I think it was a hoxa, practice, hoxa cultural practice. And our contact uh, down in South Africa said, well, in my diocese to support Elizabeth, we received a circular from the bishop, Eddie Daniels. Eddie is a good evangelical, one of the good bishops in South Africa, saying that he had removed the license of, uh, what was her name, uh, Thambaka Tom, a woman priest. And Thambaka Tom had been, had been a uh, non-stipendary priest, but she was also training to be a Sangamo, a diviner. And she now started coming to church dressed in her witch doctor costume, if you will, her tribal uh, up, and felt there was no problem with being an Anglican and a shaman. And he relieved her of her license. And I said, is this a problem? He said, well, the problem is, is that there's some retired and older bishops who have the liberal persuasion uh, who are trying to uh, mimic the African, yeah. the African independent churches, the churches that are not tied to any national denomination, but are basically combinations of African spirituality and Christian uh, practices, in, internally African, externally Christian. And they think for basically woke purposes that this is a good thing. Now, we, now if I may... Inter interject here, we cannot as Westerners condemn them for this. Because, Kevin, do you remember the consecration of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, installation of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey? Lots of things I remember. I remember Bishop of the Diocese of Rhode Island, Bishop Wolf, had to deal with a uh, priest who wanted to uh, play, place both sides of uh, Christianity. I forget what she was. We had a another a Muslim Christian. Yeah, Muslim. She Christian. was the Muslim Christian. She was the Muslim Christian. I remember we had a priest who had a spirit guide, um, and uh, had a spirit animal. I remember Catherine Jeffrey Shorey's uh, consecration, where we had dancing spirits uh, with little waving banners going down the, the front of the uh, uh, aisle when she was processed processed up into the altar. I, you know, so no, we can't say, oh, holier than thou. We, we, you know, we never go there. No, we, we've been there. 
And Diocese Christi of Los Angeles. Yeah, well, Christianity has been there. This is no different than first century Gnosticism. This is no different than BC Gnosticism, you know. Diocese of Los Angeles at its last consecration had smudge pots from Native Americans uh, to propitiate the spirits using sage. And oh, well, this is a local custom to show how inclusive we are. At the end of the day, there's no difference from using smudge pots to uh, bring about the spirits than our most wonderful of wonderful stories, Kevin Oakwise the Druid, the uh, Episcopal priest in suburban Philadelphia, who by day, by day was a respectable Episcopal clergyman, by night was a Druid who would gather mistletoe from oak trees and dance around naked in the moonlight. And, you know, I think that man was mental myself. I, I don't think this was a, a fully developed theology. I think this guy just cracked and went, yeah, it, it, under the pressure. But the, but, What's what's the tie between uh, all of these things, you know, from the Connecticut religious but not spiritual to ancestor worship, China, the CCP, the Communist Chinese Communist Party, has instructed the Three Self Patriotic Movement, Christian Council of China, the official Protestant churches, that the CCP is producing a new edition of the Bible. Was it the King James Version or the German Mao? Well, the German Mao Version has some editorial changes. When Jesus uh, forgives the woman caught in adultery, it's changed from go and sin no more to Jesus saying, go and sin no more, for I am a sinner too. Wow. <laughs> Let's see. In other words, Jesus is a wise teacher. He's not God. Jesus is just a man. And, He's only here. And in other words, the, the Chinese Communist Party is changing the Bible to make it in conform with Mao Zedong thought, with, with uh, President Xi thought. What's the link from Xi to shamans in South Africa, uh, smudge pots in LA, uh, spiritual but, but not religious among the commuter set in Connecticut? It's all the work of Satan. None of this is new. None of this. The Nazis did what the Chinese communists are doing. The Nazis de Judaized the Bible. Mm -hmm. They tried to make Jesus an Aryan because Jews were polluted blood and therefore not a, a good German Aryan could not worship a Jew. It, it's just sometimes, and I, I'm at fault at this, sometimes I get worked up about the latest silliness from Justin Welby the latest dumb thing when in the reality is I need to be fighting the works of Satan and there's a major difference between complaining about incompetence and complaining about the concerted campaign by the devil and his allies to destroy the faith of Jesus Christ in the world and I'm guilty of having more fun picking on incompetence than I am in fighting the good fight against the darkness it's not a war of blood and flesh. You know, this is a spiritual war with principalities and spirits. And, you know, we, we have to understand at the end of the day, we are not fighting a, a fair fight because Satan uses confusion. He uses this, you know, this current generation who, you know, mean well, but are adopting transgenderism, who mean well, but are adopting a hedonism, who mean well, but have become their own idols to themselves and have lost just any a, idea what it means to uh, have a, a, not a spiritual life, but a, a life transformed by the kingdom. You know, it, it's, it's very difficult to watch. You know, meaning well sh has been the excuse for so many people throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take an extreme example. Adolf Hitler thought that he was saving the human race by destroying the Jews. He meant well. He now try to understand. No, get your yeah, head on that. Yeah, yeah, see it from, his Adolf Hitler's, yeah. from Adolf Hitler's crazed, warped, sick mind, mm -hmm. he was doing the world a service by killing the Jews because the Jews were destroying and polluting civilization and culture. He meant well. Stalin. Um, Stalin meant well. 
Yeah. Now, it's difficult now to jump to things that are less because, oh, you're saying so-and-so is another Hitler. No, we're not. No, no. We're no. talking about the argument that uh, good intentions is enough. Good intentions is never enough. So faith in Jesus Christ is basically the bottom line and allowing Christ to transform you and change you, not you changing the world into your own image. Um, be it as changing the world into an image of a suburban commuter with their glass of Chardonnay and their Volvo um, in Connecticut to uh, witch doctors in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. That's Satan's, Satan's one message is it's all about you. Everything that you see and do in here is all about you. Where the gospel message is, no, it's, it, it's all about God. It's all about Christ. It's all about the Trinity. It's all about you being transformed by something greater than you. Yeah. And, and part of, I think, what, you know, before this show, Kevin and I pray. We pray for each other. We pray for our families. We pray for our work. We pray for our audience. And I can remember from the, our prayer before this service that we not be spiteful, we not be silly, that we enhearten and encourage and give people the confidence to express their faith, to talk about their faith, to engage with their faith, and not allow the world to buffalo them or to run them over to go along to get along. See, Christians, we have an obligation to uphold and uplift each other. And as our brothers and sisters are going through terrible suffering, be it the suffering of an Iranian priest on the point of being martyred, or the suffering of a, uh, of a suburban Connecticut housewife who doesn't know whether she should follow Jesus or follow the latest, greatest uh, trend in society. We need to be there for each other. Well, and back to definitions. And right now, I see in society the war between pride and shame. You know, shame and and uh, what is revealed in your heart by the Holy Spirit to help transform your life is a good thing. It's to reveal sin within you. But we have this new hedonist thing called pride, where there is no shame in what we do, and we should not be shamed in any way, shape perform or feel guilty or let the Holy Spirit reveal the sin within us. That's that's ridiculous. We shouldn't do it. And we'll see in these final days now this 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 war going on between pride and shame. And the only shame now that exists in this woke culture is your white shame. That's the only shame allowed right now. There's no shame for your sins, your adultery, your sexual sins, your greedy sins, your evil doing sins. The only shame allowed is, or, or mentioned, I should say, not allowed. The only shame mentioned is your white privilege and your white shame. And we've re just redefined everything. So, oh, well. Hey, George, what a great show. Nice and compact. We're hitting out here in 45 minutes. Not bad at all. Now, we're gonna, it, yeah, go ahead. Indian corruption. No, no, we're good. Next week. <laughs> You know, here's a great time, great time to, to ask our audience. Please, this week, uh, keep us in your prayers. Uh, George is going through a stressful time with uh, his mortgage. I'm going to have to get a root canal done uh, and uh, my cataract surgery done in the next couple of weeks. So uh, keep us both in your prayers as uh, uh, God continues to lead us and uh, use this ministry to do wonderful things. Pray for the people who listen to uh, Anglican Scripture that they would not be transformed by Kevin or George but they've been transformed by the, the, the gospel message that hopefully is coming through us. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 720 of Anglican Unscripted.